Newton's law of universal gravitation. Force is equal to g m1 m2 divided by radius squared. The reason you have weight, the reason a dropped stone accelerates downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared. And there you are, standing on a scale, seeing the effects of all these attractions between all the masses in you and all the masses of the Earth. Add those vectors together. The result is an attractive force down to the center of the Earth. Its magnitude is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between your center of mass and the center of the Earth. Just what we wanted. But what if we smoothed out the earth and shrunk ourselves down and then drilled halfway down to the core? What would the scale read then? To find out, let's break the earth in two, the inner sphere and an outer region. But ignore the outer region, because its effects of gravity cancel out. And let's get to work with Newton's law of universal gravitation. Uniform density, mass is proportional to volume, proportional to radius cubed, that half a radius earth, has one-eighth the mass. Distance is one-half as much, and that part gets squared. Put it all together, and the new weight force will be half of the measured weight from the surface. Great. No. Terrible. You skipped over all the important parts. The mass of the outer region cancels out. Well, says who? And before that, you added all those attractive forces together and just pretended that all the Earth's mass is located at its center? Yeah, that would make it easy, but what makes it right? Would the same thing work for a giant cube? Why or why not? Well, to find out, I copied information that I found online. The link is in the description, and we'll start outside the planet. There's a mass m, which is a distance d from the center of the planet, planet of radius r. The key to solving this problem will be to unwind the planet and build it up again using calculus. Oh, and I read online that this was the problem, the motivation behind Newton inventing his calculus, but I don't know if that's true. Anyway, the Earth is a big ball of yarn. Well, no, it's not, but it could be. That would be one way of adding more matter bit by bit by bit until you have the size and the shape you want. Now, Newton, of course, did something a little bit more orderly. To get his sphere, he collected shells. This shows four concentric spherical shells all nested together like the layers of an onion. The next step will be taking one shell, or one half shell here, this is the outer one, and breaking it up into a series of rings. Again, this is a ring. A bunch of these rings together make up a shell, which, along with all the other shells inside of it, will make up a sphere, the spherical Earth. But what we really care about is the shells. Our mission is to show that the gravitational force between mass m on the left there and this shell is inversely proportional to the distance to the center of that shell. If it's true for this one shell, it would be true for all the other shells and for the Earth. Ready, go, stop. What? Well, you wanted a ring, and here it is. This star is the center of the Earth. D, again, is the distance from the mass to the center of the Earth. The Earth with radius r. Theta is the angle to the ring. Theta will swing from angle 0 to angle... Uh, what do you think? To angle pi. And x is the distance from the mass to the ring. Anywhere on the ring. X is a big deal. We're going to use it to touch every part of that shell that we want to touch. And every place we touch will have a tiny piece of mass. And those pieces will add up and say that the force from the ring on the mass equals gm1, mass of the ring, divided by x squared, Newton's gravity, changed. Because we're calling the force on the ring df and the mass of the ring dm. Again, our goal is to add up all these rings to find the force from the shell. Or on the shell, it's the same thing, of course. And another thing. Cosine alpha. You thought I forgot about alpha. No, I didn't forget about alpha. But who ordered the cosine? Well, think about all those forces. Symmetry will cause them to cancel out in two of the three dimensions. Only the cosine alpha component of the force will survive. Got it? There. We integrate now the force from all the rings together to find the force from this shell. The tough part will be thinking about dm, the mass of the ring. And one reason it's tough is that not all the rings have the same mass. 
mass equals density times volume. The volume of this circle of yarn or whatever it is. Volume, the product of length, height, weight, length. Well, that would be the circumference, 2 pi r prime. And the ring must have some height, t. That's weird, but that'll factor out later. And some small width, r d theta. That's a familiar result from polar coordinates. If you're not familiar with it, well, now you are. Just go with it and rearrange. Because r prime is r sine theta. And that gives us our expression for the mass of the ring, dm. Now I know you're eager to plug that into the earlier integral and find force. But first, let's find the total mass of our shell by adding all our rings, which means, yep, you guessed it, integration from zero to pi, that's right. Theta goes from zero to pi, those are the constants. That's negative cosine, this is two. Done, the mass of the shell. We'll come back to that later. Now, back to the force on the shell and plugging in dm and coughing out the constants two, pi, t, rho, that's density, r, g, m, m, oh yeah, m, that's the mass of that blue thing on the left. And this expression is still a mess because this is what you want, that vector reaching out and touching the surface of the shell. In other words, we need to get rid of the alpha and the theta, step one, cosine alpha. Get it? We'll call that progress. Step two is the law of cosines. Look that one up if it's been a while. Negative r cosine theta gets plugged in. So that part's all set because now it's all in terms of x. But what about that sine theta d theta thing? That's not a problem. Just grab this, tweak it, and differentiate. Sine theta d theta. See it? Nice. Let's plug those both in now. Looking good. Well, it's time to think about limits from one side of the sphere to the other. From d minus r to d plus r. Pull out more constants, rearrange, rearrange some more. Ready to integrate with the power rule. This is just the power rule with n equals negative two and the power rule again with n equals zero. That one's easy. Before we evaluate with the limits, note this slide because we're gonna come back to that later. Limits, limits, limits with negatives. Ready to see the d's cancel out and the r's add to four. Next, the mass of the shell. Now's the time, because we're done. The force from the shell is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance to the center of the shell. Just what we wanted, but what if you're inside the earth? Then what? What about that outer region canceling out? Well, that's easy. Well, now it's easy because we've done all the hard part. Rewind to that step and change your limits. You're still integrating from one side of the sphere to the other. But starting now at the blue dot, that means this, and this means that. Please work out the details for yourself, because when you do, you'll notice that the Ds cancel out again, and this time so do the Rs, which means the nut force from that outer region is zero. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can work the details out. And if you did, and you followed all that stuff, then you tell me, would that work for a cube-shaped Earth? Both of them? Which one? Why?